Second Corinthians, the first chapter, please. I know you brought your Bibles. I see that smile on your face. You brought your sword with you. Amen. Second Corinthians 1, first chapter, the importance of continuing in prayer. Let's start reading at verse 8 through verse 11, if you will, please. I'm reading King James. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us. Let me read that again. Verse 11. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Now, Lord Jesus, speak clearly to our minds and our hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would show us the importance of praying all the time, that we pray without ceasing. Lord, show us something of the power of prayer tonight, that as we go to prayer tonight in this church, it'll be the beginning of a new power of intercession. Now, Lord, anoint me, let your spirit be upon me as I speak your mind and your word that you relayed to me, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, folks, if you've been coming to this church, you know God has called us to prayer. We pray in this church. We, we have a Thursday night intercessory prayer meeting where people really lay hold of God. We've asked all of our department heads to call prayer meetings. We want everybody in the church to be praying. Whether it's in the nurse, you can walk back there and you'll see them meet and pray. You see all of our charities, all our heads and directors of, of Sarah House and Timothy House and Isaiah House. There's prayer going up. You remember the beginning of each year, this year we did it again. We had a three-week, three to four-week prayer chain. Almost 3,000 people signed up, praying around the clock, 24 hours a day, bombarding heaven. Prayer, seeking the face of God. And much of the blessing upon this church has been a result of a praying people and a praying church. But the Bible says we're to pray unceasingly. And the Lord's really put it on my heart to talk to you about the importance of us continuing and going on and never giving up in prayer, to move God's heart, move heaven in prayer. Now, there are three focuses of prayer I want to bring to your attention tonight. There are three areas of concern on my heart, and these are the three areas that I want this church, we'd like to have this church pray about. We're going to pray about it tonight. First of all, we'll talk about area one. The first area that I want of prayer, the first focus of prayer tonight is this. The church is called to pray for its pastors and its leaders. This is very, very clear in the scripture. Now, Paul, in the verse, in the passage I just read to you, talked about four descending levels of problems that he, as a minister of the gospel, experienced. He starts here, and he keeps going down, down, down. There are four levels here that he talks about. These levels are common to almost every Christian. When we talk about them in just a few moments, you'll say, well, that's me, Brother Dave. But it's very, it's most likely to happen in the ministry. It happened to Paul. Godly servants of the Lord are going to suffer. If you go to a church and there's a pastor who doesn't suffer in some way, I wonder about him. If you come to this church, you're going to find pastors who suffer like everybody else, and especially like the Apostle Paul. And in a passage I read to you, he speaks level one like this, the level, first level. We would not ignorant, we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of the trouble which came to us in Asia. Now, we don't know what this trouble is. Some Bible scholars believe uh, that it had to do with Demetrius, uh, others believe that most of Bible scholars believe it was in time of sickness, a, a major sickness in Paul's life. Paul doesn't talk about all the illnesses, but you can imagine a man who traveled like Paul. Can you imagine the dysentery, drinking foul water, eating strange foods, and especially all the horrible prison food that he was served? In fact, they didn't feed 
months in prison. You had to have friends bring in the food. And uh, Paul, no doubt, went through dehydration, went through dysentery, and all of these things. And most Bible scholars believe that it was in a time where he was near death, and he was very sick. And he says, I would not have you ignorant of the trouble that came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, pressed out of measure. And in the Greek, it means weighted down with burdens and heavy cares. Weighted down with burdens and heavy cares. Now let me talk to you about the suffering of men of God and the reason why the body of Jesus Christ and the church of Jesus Christ must and ought to be praying for its pastors and its leaders. Second Corinthians, go to Second Corinthians 11 chapter and verse 28, please. And just, just, uh, Go to the right to the 11th chapter. And you get a little picture of the suffering that Paul's talking about, starting at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, verse 20, starting at verse 23. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison, more frequent in death oft. Of the Jews, five times received that forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, weariness, painfulness, watchings often, hunger and thirst and fastings often, and cold and nakedness, beside these things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the cares of all the churches. Now, folks, that's quite a pressing down. Paul said, I was pressed out of measure beyond my human strength to cope. Now, I was not just pressed. I was pressed out of measure beyond all physical power and ability to cope. Now, I don't know. If you're there now, or if you have been there lately, where you have, by the cares on your job, your family cares, whatever, absolutely pressed down beyond measure. Beyond my ability, all human ability to handle it, Paul said it was beyond me. And uh, the scripture says, you know, that, that doesn't seem to bear witness with what the scripture says, God is faithful who will not lay upon you more than you're able to bear, but with the temptation make a way of escape. Say, so, well, Paul, uh, you said God's faithful and not lay burden, and now you're saying the burden's too heavy for you? He's talking about a physical problem. He's talking about the cares of the church, mental and physical problems that are pressing him down. But he wants you to know, and the scripture's clear on this, that it does not rob you of your faith. You can be pressed down. You can get so sick you don't know where you are. I've been there. I was there a couple of weeks ago with food poisoning. Uh, it, it was the most painful thing I've ever been through. And it, you, you just say, Lord, I don't even know how I'm going to make it. Some of you have gone through terrible sicknesses. This pressing down beyond measure. Absolutely pressed down beyond physical. Thing. You have to have a supernatural infusion of the power of God. And that's what Paul's saying. Humanly, I can't face that it's beyond me. He speaks of another level, even lower. He said, pressed, burdened, above strength. And what he's saying, I am wiped out. This is absolutely the problem, the trouble I'm in has wiped me out. It has drained me. I'm absolutely drained. You ever been there? Come on, have you been there? I am at the end. I am drained. I, I don't think I can handle this anymore. Absolutely drained. You see, Paul's admitting that even in the ministry, there can come troubles and problems that bring us to the end of our human endurance. Satan comes against the righteous, and he knows that he can't get you to smoke or drink or curse. He can't seduce you with the temptation of this world, so what he'll do is go after your strength. He'll go after your human strength. He'll try to weaken you by sickness, by mental problems, I mean mental cares, 
that'll press you down. You try to lay down in your bed at night and try to figure out a way out of it. And you, you finally come to a place, you tell your wife or husband or friend or you call a friend or you say to yourself or to God, I am absolutely drained. There's nothing left. This is above my strength. Press down, out of measure, above strength. He goes down even further, another level, in so much that we despaired of life. It's not that he despises, there's, there's no despair toward God, not at all, or to the ministry. But he's saying, I cannot go on another step. I'm too weak to continue. It's all over. It's all over. Paul the Apostle is at the end of his end of his ability to even think of how he's ever going to come out of this. This almost seems to contradict Paul's declaration, I desire to be dissolved, this body be dissolved, and to be with the Lord. Now, he, he said that when he had fulfilled his ministry and, and finished his course, he said that. But this is early in his ministry now, and he knows that God has a work for him to do. And, and the battle that he has in his heart right now is that there's so much to do and I don't have much strength. I don't have any strength to do it. I've got this call of God that I don't have the ability, I don't have the strength to go on. Folks, I get letters now from pastors' wives and pastors. The wives say, my husband is totally discouraged. He's going to quit the ministry. One pastor, another, it's all over the United States, giving up. Many are retiring early. And I've told you about this. And we hear a lot because we have nearly a million people on the mailing list. And the, the letters that come from pastors say, they say, I can't handle it anymore. Things are getting so bad in the ministry. There's so many problems in the church. It's taken my wife's health. It's robbed me of my strength. I've been left helpless by this and I can't go on. I'm going to quit the ministry and find an easier way to make a living. So folks, you can get out of the ministry. You think, you know, just changing jobs is going to solve anything? You just go go from one problem to another set of problems. I don't want your job, and I don't think you want my job. You couldn't have my job. You couldn't have it unless God called you anyhow. But if you ever think you want my kind of job, you better sit down with me for about three hours and let me tell you a few things. And you can tell me a lot of things about your job and your career and what you're going through. But Paul, Paul is like many, many in the, the scripture. There was... Jonah, Elijah, uh, all of these great men of God, Jeremiah, saying, they absolutely despaired of life. You can hear them say, take my life. I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to live. Love the Lord, but I, I just don't want to live. Despaired of life. And then he goes down another level. Paul goes on to say, we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Now, God didn't tell him he's going to die. Paul's going to live a long time yet. There was a ministry for this man, but, but he, he's thinking it's all over. He's saying, I, what, what he did, he, he said, I'm dead. I, this is the end of fruitfulness. I'll never be fruitful. I'm wiped out. I am drained. There's nothing left for me. It's all over. I'm too weak to go on. Convinced himself, like other men of God in the scripture, that his days of fruitfulness are over. Now, there are some of you here right now that are being tested that deep. You, you, you can see somebody sitting next to you. They may smile. They've had their hands up, clapping their hands. They look happy, but you don't know what they're going through. You're not a mind reader. You don't know. And some of you here tonight, I don't know what level you're on. I don't care if you've, or, or, you, you may have gotten down already to level or here where you've passed the sentence of death on yourself. Now, Paul came out of this terrible black hole that he was in, and he said, God, who delivered us from this great death, and he does deliver, and in whom we trust that he will keep on delivering us. Paul said that, but I'll tell you, how did he get out? It wasn't his prayers alone. You know what Paul said? First chapter, go back to... First chapter again there, verse 11. Start at verse 10 again. Who delivered us from so great a death. Did you hear the four levels of despair? 
Folks, did you hear it? Did you see how far down this pastor was? How beaten down he was? And he says, God brought me out. God delivered me, but how? Look at verse 11. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver whom we trust he will yet deliver. Ye also helping together by prayer for us. Folks, listen to me. Choir, body, I know what this is all about. I know there are times that I could have never made it, but for the prayers of intercessors that I know and intercessors in this church. Pastor Carter can say the same thing, all of our leaders and pastors. There have been times that I have been so tested, so tried physically, especially and mentally of all the cares and problems. It's not just the cares and problems of this church, but we receive hundreds of thousands in the course of a year of letters from people from all over the world and the problems are beyond. Sometimes Gwen and I just have to close it off and not read it anymore because it's overwhelming. But there are times that I've been so pressed, I've literally sat back and I could feel the Holy Ghost come upon me and God, the Spirit, made me know that it was because of the prayers of God's people. I was being lifted up. I was being strengthened. The power of God was just coming in. Folks, your pastors need prayer. If we're preaching a straight gospel, if we're prophesying, and the devil sees that, he's going to mock and ridicule and try to disgrace and do everything he can within his power to mock the servants of God. Do you pray for your pastors? Paul said, brethren, pray for us. I say, sisters, brothers, in Times Square Church, pray for your pastors. Hallelujah. Paul said, it was your prayers that helped me come out of this deep, deep trial that I've gone through. Hallelujah. Praise God. Pray for Pastor Carter. God give him strength. Uh, the devil tries to attack his body and make him weak as a kitten and try to tell him he doesn't have the strength. And, and he rises up. Pray that God give him strength. Praise God. This old man just keeps moving on and on. I'm just... <clears throat> but my boast is only in the Lord I don't know how except the prayers of people so Pastor Carter deserves that same amount of prayer that you give to Pastor Dave if you will please All right, next area of concern we're to continue praying for one another as the body of Christ we're to pray for each other you know in the, script, the scripture says helping together by prayer Pray one for another that you may be healed. And Paul said, wherefore also we pray always for you. Now, if I'm a true pastor, I'm praying for this body. I'm praying for you. I may not know your face, but when I pray, Lord, bless the whole body of Jesus Christ at Times Square Church, you're included in those prayers, and God knows those faces, and he answers those prayers. He, he, he does that, and we're to pray for one another. Now, David talked about a time of great affliction that he was in. One of the greatest times of testing in all of his life. And in his desperation, when he was so down, he uttered these awful words. He said, I said in my haste, all men are liars. Everybody's a liar. And you know what he's saying? He, he doesn't want to call God a liar. So he says, all men are liars. He's in deep affliction. The promises don't seem to work. The prayers don't seem to work. And he's down and he can't understand why this trial keeps going on. And he, he says, I, I just don't understand. It doesn't work. All men are liars. Now, folks, I've got something I want you to, I want to share with you right now. You may be down as low as Paul's talking about here, pressed beyond strength. And I wonder how many times you've had those fleeting thoughts that go through your mind. Yes, I hear all this talk about how I'm going to make it. I hear this preaching how God's going to see me through. I read those promises. And I keep hearing everything's going to turn out all right. But I just don't see it. I've been unemployed and I don't see a job. I've, I've got bills that I can't pay. And it, 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 it's just not making sense. These things are not working. I've had, I've had many that are going through a trial of their life, and they said, I don't understand, brother. If I've prayed, I've fasted, I've did, paid my tithes, and yet I'm still going through deep financial problems. 
And, and there's a tendency, if you're not careful, to have your faith in the Lord shaken and the faith in his word shaken. And then this awful accusation, all men are liars. It, you, we don't, it's not something overt, it's something secret, it's something that we think in our minds. Have you ever been to that brink where you, you were, were so tested and so tried that this despair comes over you and you just think, it's a lie. It's just a lie. It doesn't work. Be careful when you're at that point. I want you to go uh, to Jeremiah because here's a man of God who was tested in the same area. Jeremiah, the 20th chapter. Folks, I want to encourage you by his word tonight. Beginning to read, this is the 20th chapter of Jeremiah, beginning to read at verse 7. Now, this is a great prophet of God, a holy righteous man. But this man is really being tested. And listen to him, verse 7. Oh Lord, what's it say? Thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art strong than I am. He's saying, Lord, it's not fair. You're bigger than I am. You're too strong for me. You prevailed. I'm in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. <laughs> Look at me, folks. Is, I don't hear any more talk about this. It's not working. I preach my heart out. I prophesy. And I feel deceived. It's the same thing. It's a lie. It's not working. Now don't try to tell me. Don't sit there so innocent. So I've never been there. Never thought that. Fess up. Come on now. Let the word of the Lord find its place. But his word was in my mouth as a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary with more bread. I could not stop or stay. I couldn't be quiet. Hallelujah. Folks, there are times I've been down, and I'll get alone with God, and I'll just start pouring out my heart. And I'll, I'll just tell the Lord, it doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. He said, bring forth your strong reason. Come on, pour it out. Don't get on the phone and talk to somebody. Take it to God. Lay it down before him and say, Lord, this thing doesn't seem to be working. But I don't want to accuse you. And I just start praising. Just lift your hands and start saying, Lord, there's a fire in my bones. I love you. Begin to worship and praise him. Folks, there are times I've gone in this secret closet so downcast. And I've come out shouting because he's encouraged me. He's strengthened me by the power of the Holy Ghost in his presence. I dare you to come out in a secret closet downcast if you pour your soul out with everything is in you. Unbosom yourself to God. Pour your heart out. Like every question, every problem, lay it out to him. He's bigger than you are. He's big enough to handle it. He knows your heart. He wants to get that out of you so it doesn't linger in you. Remember what Jesus said to Peter? He prayed that his faith fail not. Now, folks, I'm talking you say, what's that have to do with praying for the body of Jesus Christ? Now, folks, we, we usually pray for our brother and sister, Lord, bless their finances, heal their sick in their families, and give them jobs, do all these things. That's fine. We to do that. But the scripture makes it clear that one of our primary prayers for one another is that our faith fail not. When you see a brother or sister going through a problem, pray. It, it's not necessarily, Lord, bring them out of that problem. Lord, you know why the test. You know what's going on. I don't. I'm not going to judge this. But Lord, don't let their faith fail. Don't let them question you. God, don't let them believe it's a lie. That's what God wants us to pray for this body in New York City, that everyone that you know, everyone a part of this body, that you will pray, oh God, in the testing times ahead, when we go through hard times and we go through testing times, Lord, let there be faith rise. Let my faith be contagious. 
Let me have faith that I can speak a word of faith. We got enough people going around downgrading God and, and murmuring and complaining. God, hold your faith strong so you can speak faith in the lives of others. Amen. Paul wrote to the Roman Christians, I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe. Deliver me from those who don't believe. Now, I offer you a suggestion, saints. If you have an associate, if you have a friend that's full of doubt and unbelief, take a three-month vacation from them. Just tell them, say, look, I'm going to pray for you, but I, I can't get this infection you have. I don't want this infection in me. I love you, I'll pray with you, but please, I don't want to hear that negative stuff anymore. Uh, have you ever listened to some people? All, all week long, all month long, all year long. Oh, I'll never make everything wrong. Everything's wrong. God, prayer's not being answered. Nothing's going right. Everything's wrong. As if they had no God. God says, pray against that. Pray against that unbelief. Bible says, pray you want to know that you may be healed. Healed of what? Unbelief. Praise you, Jesus. Almost every backslider I talk to would tell, tell me about the same thing. I hear it everywhere I go. Those that used to come to church on fire for God, and now they're gone. They've, they've turned their back and they're bitter. And almost everyone will tell you, well, God wasn't answering my prayers. I didn't see the promises working. God wasn't there when I needed him. I, 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 I was being tested and tempted. And I, 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 I heard from the pulpit that the Holy Ghost was there to empower me. I, I was told by the word of God and the preacher, they were telling me that in my time of trial, God will let me bear more and I'm able to bear. And he let me bear more. I can't handle it. He wasn't there. And when I was tempted, I gave in. I had no power. I was weak. It didn't work. You'll find almost every backstory, everybody's bitter against God will say the same thing. They're angry. They're going to tell you in so many words, it's all a lie. It doesn't work. It didn't work for me. Now, folks, that's a dangerous place to be in, and we don't want that in the church of Jesus Christ. So this is something we should pray against, against unbelief in the house of God. We're going to do that tonight. Say, God, encourage my brother, encourage my sister. Remove all doubt, not in judgment, but in love. Lord, bring healing of all unbelief in the body of Christ here in New York City. Now, the final area that I want to talk about for prayer is that when people pray corporately together, as we do in this church, we prevail against principalities and powers of darkness. God is moved to act when we pray. Now, I'm going to quickly take you, for the next ten minutes, I'm going to take you through a bunch of scriptures, and I want to prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that when people get together, God's people pray, things happen. Oh, do they happen. First of all, prayer of the righteous availeth much. That's what the scripture says. Now, remember when Moses changed God's mind? Remember God said because they had the golden calf and were stiff-necked and rebellious and idolatrous, he said, Moses, leave me alone. Don't talk to me about it. I'm going to wipe them out and raise up a new people. I'll give you a fresh seed. I'll give you new people. I'll, I'll, I'll start with nothing and start all over again. Moses, the scripture, Lord says, leave me alone that my wrath may wax, wax hot against them. Bible said, but Moses besought the Lord or, or prayed with passion. This is what it means. He prayed with passion. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. God changed his mind. To a man of God who prayed and sought to face it. Does prayer prevail? A whole race of people were saved by this man's prayer. In Exodus, the 17th chapter, you find the Amalekites at war with Israel. And Moses goes up on a hillside. And the Bible says 
when Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hands, Amalek prevailed. Now, lifting up the hand, that doesn't mean that Moses just standing there with his hands up. That means he was up there interceding with God. He was praying with his hands raised. And then when he got tired and he, he just dropped them. Remember, Aaron Hur uh, saw what was happening. When the hands went down, Israel was losing the battle. So they got up, one on each arm and held it up. And Moses kept on praying with his hands raised and Israel won the battle. What would have happened if he'd let down? They could not have prevailed. I don't know why God works that way. I don't know why he makes so much of his movement, so much of his acts and subject to our prayer. The Bible says when he let down his hands, Amalek or Satan prevailed. You let down on your prayers and the enemy is going to have a heyday. You let down your guard and something's going to happen. The Bible says be on guard, pray unceasingly. And go, go with me to Second Chronicles, please. 20th chapter, Second Chronicles. How quick can you get there now? Second Chronicles, the 20th chapter. You have it? Uh, we're going to read first 13 verses quickly. It came to pass after this also, children of Moab, Ammon, them also the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. There came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, there comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea. Verse 3, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed to fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Verse 6, they prayed, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? Rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Now look at me, please. I'm not going to read the rest of it right there. Here, here's a multiplied, a, a huge army coming against Israel and Jerusalem. Jehoshaphat calls the people together and they begin to pray. And they begin to seek God. Verse 12, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this company that cometh against us. Neither know what we to, neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. That means they were praying. The whole nation, all of God's people, together, corporately, were praying for a victory. Hallelujah. Verse uh, 14. And you read on down through verse 19. You'll find verse 17, the word of the Lord came. He said, you will not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord your God. O Judah, Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. The Lord will be with you. Hallelujah. Verse 22. When they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. Verse 23. And the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, and utterly to slay and destroy them. When they made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. Now, folks, you're going to find out. Look look at me, please. A total victory was won. And, and the Bible makes it clear. And, and the prophet says, because we sought the Lord, because we prayed. Folks, would there have been a battle won? Or would Israel have been overrun by the enemy if they had not called the body together and prayed and sought the Lord? It was clearly through prayer. Go over to Isaiah 37, to the right, Isaiah 37. Now you remember this story. Hezekiah is the king. Jerusalem is surrounded by the great Assyrian army. And they've got a captain named Rabshakeh. And he's threatening them every day. And then he sends them a letter. Chapter 37 of Isaiah. They send them a letter warning them that they're going to invade. And they say, our God's going to wipe you out. Nobody's been able to withstand us. And so Hezekiah calls on the prophet Isaiah. And the prophet Isaiah, look at verse 14. Begin to read at verse 14 with me, if you will, please. 
Hezekiah has just received this letter from the Assyrian army from Rabshakeh. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messenger and read it. Hezekiah went up unto the house of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. And you, right on down, you see his prayer. Verse 20, Now therefore, o Lord, our God, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that the Lord, thou art the Lord, even thou alone. Go to verse 33, if you will, please. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same way he shall return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. I'll defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for my save it, David's sake. And the Lord, and the angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and four score and five thousand. When they rose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Folks, that battle was won through prayer. Isaiah said, because we sought the Lord. The battle was won because we sought the Lord. Folks, can you understand what God can do through prayer? It's amazing. All through the scripture. Isaiah said, God shall, verse 33, God saith, whereas or because. Now, folks, do, do you have, it's in, uh, See what chapter thirty-seven? I can't find it. But the, here, here, here's the scripture: where God saith, "Whereas because thou hast prayed to me against the Assyrians, God will turn them back; they shall not come into this city." It's because, or whereas you prayed, whereas you sought my face, they shall not come into this city. Hallelujah! I. Uh, I told a reporter who was interviewing me from the Daily News this past week, he asked about the crime rate going down. I said, I think it's a shame that Mayor Giuliana and the city government here won't give God any credit because we have prayed against the spirit of murder and so have other churches in this city, and they don't even give God an ounce of credit. They don't give him any credit at all, but folks, it's been the prayers of God's people that have brought down the crime rate and changed things. How do you remember the story in the book of Esther? Mordecai gets this news that a decree has been made that all the Jews are to be slain in the whole land and a date's given and he sends a note to his, his niece Esther and you know what Esther said to Mordecai? Go, gather together all the Jews, fast for me, do not eat or drink for three days and nights I also and my maids will fast likewise, and I will go to the king. They called everybody to fast and to pray for three days, night and day. And folks, you know the story in the book of Esther, how God defended the Jews. Instead of killing them, they were able to slay their enemies. They were able to take, they, they were given honor. Mordecai becomes the right-hand man to the king. God blesses Esther. God delivered the whole Jewish nation through three days of fasting and prayer. Amazing. Now, folks, before I close tonight, there are some people think that just because they're in the right cause, they don't have to pray. If you're, you're in the right and you've got the right cause, you just go and you'll be successful. That's not so because remember when Gibeah, though, that Gibeonite city where these homosexuals, this roving mob, attacked all night long and slew the concubine of a Levite? He cut her body in 12 pieces and sent it throughout Israel. They were so enraged, they went against Gibeah and the Benjamites. 400,000 Israelites go against the Benjamites. The Benjamites, there's almost a quarter million of them defending Gibeah's right because they were Benjamites also, defending the right to be openly flaunted gays and murder. And so 400,000 of Israel gather against them and they go up against the Gibeonites and the Benjamites, in the first battle they lost to 22,000 soldiers. And they were weeping, they were crying. They go up shortly after and they lost the battle again. And this time, 18,000 men were lost. Here, in two battles, 40,000 with the right cause and on the right side. 
and they lost the battle. And then they did what they should have done when they started. The Bible says, then all the children of Israel and all the people went up to the house of God and wept and sat there to seek the Lord and fasted. And they inquired of the Lord. And folks, immediately the scripture says after that, and the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel that very day. They went up to the house of God. They began to fast, they began to pray, they began to call on the name of the Lord, and God heard them and answered and gave them victory. You can give yourself to a right cause. I don't care if it's abortion, I don't care if it's child abuse, I don't care if it's against drug addiction, whatever. You can be in the right cause. You, you can have be on the right side, but the Lord says, I'm not going to act, I'm not going to move until I hear the cry from the hearts of my people. You've got to, before you take any action, before you get into any cause, you've got to be a man or woman of prayer and seek my face. Now, folks, God wants to move in New York City. He wants to pour out his spirit, not just on this church, but every God-seeking church, every Bible-preaching church in this city, God wants to move. I'm not talking about just having a physical manifestation. I'm talking about the glory of God coming down. And I'm talking about hundreds of thousands being saved. Being saved by the power of Christ. Folks, we're going to go to prayer in just a few minutes. But I want you to stand, if you will, please. The next 25 minutes, we're going to seek the face of God. Hallelujah. Now, look this way, please. Let me tell you how we're going to do this right now. The altar call. I'm not calling anybody up here tonight. I'm not calling anybody to come forward. I'm turning the whole church into an altar right now. We're turning the whole church into an altar. Now, here's what I want you to do. Even if you're a visitor, please don't be embarrassed. We're going to, we're going to ask you in just a few moments to, to pair off in fours, or five or maybe even six, just in a circle. And I want you to hold hands. The Bible said, if two or three agree together concerning anything, it shall be done to the Father in heaven. And I want you to pray for everybody in your circle. God, let everybody in this circle have faith that is ever increasing. Let their faith grow strong in these dark days ahead. God, bless my brother, bless my sister. We're to pray one for another. Folks, don't do it just perfunctly. Don't do it just because, don't let it be empty words. Let your heart go out to your brother and sister and say, Lord, I'm concerned about my brother and sister. I want you to let their faith grow and be strong. And I want you to pray for your pastors. Name your pastors before God. Don't say, Lord, just bless our pastor. Bless Brother Dave. Or, 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 or keep him from the wicked one. Keep him from the powers of destruction. The devil always, he's always trying to put a fear in me that I'd be shot or killed in this city. But I want to tell you something, there's an angel power. And there, there's a, there's a power of God around you. But folks, I want to tell you something, God waits for our prayers. You have got to pray for that. We pray for your protection, that God will keep you from the wicked one. He'll keep you from the snares of the devil. He'll keep you from any knife or bullet or robbery. God will keep you. Pray for that for your brother and sister, for the faith and the keeping power of Jesus, physically and spiritually. And then I want you to pray, God, fill this church with your glory and save a multitude. Ask the Lord to start saving souls on the right hand and on the left hand. And ask God to make you an evangelist. And literally, now folks, in the last few weeks, there's been a wonderful power of the presence of Jesus. It's growing, it's intensifying, but that's the time to lead, lay hold of God in prayer as we've never prayed before. Now, if you've backslidden, if you're not right with Jesus, all you have to do right now in that circle of power and prayer is say, Lord, forgive me and cleanse me. We're not looking for numbers. We're believing Jesus. Now, this church is going to be a praying church as never before. We're going to seek the face of God. Occasionally, we're going to have somebody come up to the microphone and be praying. But I want this whole body right now. Turn around, if you will, please. And first of all, I want you to introduce yourself to everybody in your circle. I want you to take a minute. 
and get everybody's name, please, and where they're from. If they're out of town, let it be known. Thank you.